morning. <clears throat> I have a kind of a raspy <clears throat> voice this morning, so I've got my water. I apologize for that. I'm so glad to be here with you guys today, and I uh, welcome those that are watching online. Now, we are going to continue uh, this series that we've been in, Healthy on the Inside and Out, right? <clears throat> and so what we've been talking about is actually aligning our values inside so it matches what's going out on the outside. And today, we're going to be brave. We're going to tackle conflict, right? I call it the slippery slope of conflict because it's really hard, you know, to have sure footing when we go into a situation with conflict. So we're going to need the Holy Spirit, which is God's presence, to help us. So why don't you just bow your heads, and I'm going to ask him to come. Yes, Father. Holy Spirit, I invite you here just to come, Father, and, and help us. I ask that you'd help, that you'd heal my voice, Father, that I would deliver the message that you placed in my heart, for I am indeed a weak vessel, but you are everything. You are strong. And so, Holy Spirit, I ask that you'd come and move upon the hearts of your people, Lord, that you would begin to open them up, Father, so they could receive what it is that you have, that they would have courage, knowledge, and ability, Father, to take this this land that you say, Father, that we are to take in our lives. And so, Holy Spirit, come and do what only you can do. Come and meet us in this place. Come and speak to us, Father, about how to handle conflict. We look to you today in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You know, conflict is something that's all around us, isn't it? Right? I mean, even everywhere you turn, there's conflict. You turn on the TV and it's there. It's everywhere around us. I mean, I was thinking about the different conflicts that I have run into over the time. And I was thinking about even at work, before I worked here, you know, that we can encounter them. Like, I was thinking about uh, this time I was selling when I was younger. And I would sell things. And it was my first day on the job. And I asked the coworker after our, the Lord had blessed me. I sold a lot that day. And I asked her to help me to write up uh, my paperwork to submit it. And she said, sure, sure. So she helped me. And she said, I'll, I'll drop it off at the office. I said, okay. Only to be called down later to realize that she put her name on my work. <laughs> right? And stuff. And so there's conflict there. Our conflict can arise when we have uh, a friendship over a long period of time. And that friend decides uh, to share some of the ups and downs and things that you have shared with her with other people. Conflict, right? Or what about when you've got your child and you go to pick them up, <clears throat> you know, and, you're, and you know you're in a hurry and you go to the Y and you get them out of the day camp, right? And he doesn't want to go. Your six-year-old doesn't want to go. And you put him in the car seat in the back and he just has what a six-year-old can do, a meltdown, right? Where he's crying and screaming and he's kicking the back of your seat, right? Amen. We've been there, right? <clears throat> What's a person to do? Conflict, just like flooding in. Or what about for those of you who are now uh, of age where you are now taking care of your parents, right? And trying to figure out what does that exactly look like, you know? And all the conflict of being uh, an adult caregiver now instead of the child that was nurtured under a parent is conflict. It's hard. Or worse yet, when you sit across the table from, you know, from your life partner, from your spouse, and they begin to pour out to you that they're not happy in the relationship anymore, right? And they begin to tell you all the things they dislike that you're doing, right? And with each word and with each disclosure, it feels like a, a, a knife stabbing in your heart. These are conflicts. And they exist everywhere around us. You cannot escape them. And I would even venture to say that some of you that came in today, you had an argument with the person you came with before you came in, right? And you could probably tell me about a lot of stories that you've encountered. Listen, conflict is everywhere. And what I find is most people will run away from conflict, right? They want to pretend it's not there, it doesn't matter. And, and so they close their eyes and they hide from it. That is, until the time they can't shove it down anymore and it explodes out and they quit the job or they walk away from the relationship. Or worse yet, they get into behaviors that, that hurt themselves, like drinking, right? Or doing drugs, or eating too much, or having uh, all kinds of sexual partners, right? They just kind of spin off because they're trying to handle all the emotions. 
Yet God says to you and I that there is a way that we can handle conflict, that we can look at surely straight in the eye and we can find success there. I'm going to start out with this scripture today. It says in Matthew 5, 8, it says God blesses. He gives divine favors what this is. He blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called what? Children of God. We are called the children of God. And so he doesn't want us to run away from conflict. He wants us to lean into it. He wants us to solve it. He wants to, for you and I to become peacemakers. That's what he wants. He wants you to become peacemakers. Now, here you go. I'm very well aware that we've not really been taught how to do conflict. We'll just kind of pattern what our parents did or what the authorities in our lives did, and we just kind of play that out. So today I want to talk to you about how to handle conflict and what's at the heart of conflict, right? And so today what I've done is I'm going to give you five different strategies you can use, and these are very simple, simple strategies to navigate conflict, Right? And we're going to go through them quickly here. So the first strategy is to set up the right time. You see, when you find yourself in a conflict, it's probably, <clears throat> and you start to talk and you realize it's not getting solved right away, I'm going to suggest that you call the audible, that you call a timeout, right? You're going to set a time to meet at another place, right? Another time. Uh, and I don't care if you're the one who's being offended <clears throat> or you're the offender, I want you to take the initiative there. Why? Because I believe, as it says in Ecclesiastes 8, 6, there is a right time and a right way to do everything. There is a constant right time. There's, there's a time to do something, right? A time, and we have to be able to read our environment. So what is this right time, Sharon, that you're talking about? Well, what I'm talking about is setting up a time that works for both of you, right? That can work for you. And so you do it when you're not tired and you're not compressed, Right? You don't do it right before you go to bed or right at, at, at uh, um, you know, when there's a lot going on around you. And you do it quickly. Now, with COVID, sometimes it takes a little bit longer. But try to, try to make sure that conflict happens, you know, as, uh, that you have that meeting time soon. Why? <clears throat> because the meeting time, what that does is uh, if, you do, if you procrastinate, it takes just too long. Then wounds fester. Okay? It's not good. It's not good. And also, when you do this conflict and you set up this time to actually have that time to talk, what you want to do is you want to make sure it's face-to-face. -face. Again, we're in COVID, and I know that, right? But there's something with the face. There's something when I get up here and I'm not all covered up where you can read my expressions, you can read my body language. It's important that you do uh, this time together where you can see each other. Even if you're distant six foot, okay, that's fine. But have the conversation. Please don't do it over email, right? Don't, don't do it over texting. <laughs> and goodness me, don't do it on social media, right? These are all places that are not good for conflict. So setting the time up to have an in-depth conversation is important. So what does it look like exactly, Sharon? Well, you just call the audible. Andy and I have been doing this for a long time. When we get in a conflict, I know for some of you it's like, you've got to be kidding. You, co you have conflict with Andy? Amen. Yes. <laughs> yes. I'm a type A. Lots of conflict. Okay? But we have come up with a language where we say we need to set a time because you can't have that. You can't move forward in the space that you're given when that thing pops up. So what you do is something like this. Hey, can we please table this conversation for another time? Because I can see that you need to really talk to me about this, and I need to express and listen, and I can't right now. When's a good time in the next couple of days for you? See that? That easy. So I want to suggest that one of the strategies you use to navigate conflict is you set up a time, a meeting time. The next one here is that you set the right attitude. You set up a right attitude. Well, an attitude is, is by which you govern yourself, right? And the scripture tells us here, speak the truth in a spirit of love. So it's talking about attitude. It's, it's really talking about us speaking to other people as we would want them to speak to us. That we act towards other people as we want them to act to us. So when you come to a meeting, you come with humility. You come with a heart that's open, right? You come, you know, with uh, kindness and gentleness and all the fruit of the Spirit when you come to that meeting. And you just kind of lay out what you think, right? The truth 
according to you or according to me. What the truth is, we lay it out so that we can talk about it. And we don't blame people and, and we, uh, you know, we, don't, we don't play games with it. We just kind of come to each other, right? This is going to be important <clears throat> to come with those kinds of attitudes, no games or nothing. Now, one of the things that helps me uh, to do this is also the way we speak to each other, right? And that's my next point we got to talk about up here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, is the verbiage that we use. This is going to be very important. The verbiage is the way we talk to each other, right? It's, it's our word choices. And our word choices have great power, and you need to understand that. They have, I don't care who you are, you have great power in your words. The scripture reminds us, thoughtless words, which is what happens when we get upset with somebody, right? We just come out, boom, with all these words. But it says thoughtless words, look what happened. <clears throat> can wound as deeply as the sword. So it's that dagger, boom, boom, in your heart, right? But wisely spoken words can heal. And so what I want you to see is that you have great power with your words and your word choices. And it's very important that you slow down and make sure your word choices are important. Now, I want to talk to my ladies for a moment in this room, okay? From one gal to another, listen. God has done an incredible thing with us girls. We have the capacity to feel hugely and have lots of emotions, right? Yes, amen. Okay, <clears throat> now with that, uh, what I have found over my 61 years is males cannot keep up. They just cannot, not if you're married to them or, or you work with them, okay? And so we, it becomes incumbent upon us just to kind of dial back. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you right, to be able to navigate the conversation and to choose words that will bring life. This is very important. Well, I hear a lot of times people say, well, what if I'm verbally attacked? Like somebody's like yelling at me, right? Well, I'm going to suggest to do what I do. I just step back. I deep breathe. I wait for a lull. And then I just kind of insert the reason we're meeting or the reason we're having this meeting is because, and I restate the purpose, right, and then, and then I, I, I tell them, I ask them, hey, it, did, do, do you feel attacked by me? Right? I take the courage to ask them that. And when they say yes, which is usually what is, what's being communicated a lot of times, then you just, you just go, I'm sorry. Right? You ask for forgiveness, please forgive me. That's not my intent. Right? And so you bring the unthinkable to the table. There are feelings. And you talk about it, and you say, I'm sorry, that's not what I'm trying to accomplish here. And by the way, if that happens from here on out, please tell me so that I can change my communication style. And, and then you also add, and if, you, if I feel like you're doing that to me, I'll stop you and say the same. Do you see that? We, we work together, right? And so now when we're looking at these strategies, we've talked about the verbal, the verbiage, the, the conversation, the word choice. I want to talk about setting the right atmosphere, right? Setting the right atmosphere. When we come into conflict, we can be in charge of the atmosphere. We are um, not thermometers, but thermostats. Thermostats sets the temperature in a room, right? That's what you are. And you see the, the uh, attitude you want to bring in there is to be able to cooperate, you want to cooperate. You want to work together. It's not a game for winning and losing. The, um, the verse here that's in Romans 12, 18 says, do everything possible to like set the environment, everything possible on your part to live in peace with everyone. And so you want to be able to uh, set this cooperation. And you know what I have found when I look for cooperation, trying to set that? You know what has to leave the room? My pride, <laughs> Right? My self-centeredness. Those things have to leave the room when we are trying to work and, and come up, you know, uh, to cooperate. And I tell you, as a peacemaker, as peacemakers, what we want to do is we want to go after the compromise. You see, there are two people, two people in that room, and so there has to be a compromise. So you have to be able to talk, right? And I know it's painful. I know it's very painful when we get in a conversation that's there's thwarted with conflict and we want to run and hide. But I would say just stay and listen. Listen, because the pain won't go away. There won't be a resolution until you're able to compromise, find the compromise. So you want to set up this place where everybody is getting a word in. Okay, very important. Now, the last one 
I want to talk about is setting the right focus. The right focus, right? So what is this right focus? Well, I want you to emphasize reconciliation and not resolution, right? Reconciliation looks at the relationship, right? And then that becomes bigger than the resolution looks at the problem. And when you're going to handle relational issues, then you need to recognize that reconciliation is what you're after. You see, when you focus on reconciliation, the person becomes bigger and the, the problem that exists becomes smaller. When you're focused on reconciliation, right, you look more in terms of this coordination, this cooperation, being able to compromise. All these things get flushed out that way when you're able to uh, have the proper focus. This is very important because the scripture does tell us that we need to work hard. And these ones that I'm giving you aren't easy. I mean, they're easy for me to throw up on a board, but they are hard to do. Work hard at living with peace with everyone, right, with others. And so we want to be able to, to jump off and to do that. Now, I've just run through really quickly these five strategies. Guys, these are easy strategies. They really are. They're not complicated. I'm not a complicated person, right? And these strategies here, do you know what at the base of all those strategies are? They're the heart of the vineyard. It's what you would hear if you went to Growth Track 3 today. These are our values. They're playing themselves out in the conflict management uh, arena, right? But these are very important. Matter of fact, I know I've gone through so fast that some of you are like, whoa, wait, I can't take notes fast enough. Let me tell you where I got it from, right there. This book I've had for, I guess, about 10 years, right? And The Peacemaker by Ken Sand, this, this book is excellent. It can take and it'll, it'll describe more in detail uh, what I've been talking to you about today. And it gives you so many more strategies. I just took some key ones that I put up that mean something to me, right? Listen, though, doesn't matter if you have all the strategies in the world because really the heart of the matter here the heart of the matter is, at the end of the day, once you've had your conferences and done all your strategizing and whatever, at the end of the day, you are still faced with, will you forgive? Will you forgive the offense that you have felt? At the end of the day, that's what's going to be required of you. And this is one of the most important parts of conflict management, guys. I can't stress it enough. This is actually what gets, has gotten me uh, to this point where I wanted to talk to you is this next part about forgiveness. Because I talk to so many people that go, I just can't forgive. I really, I just can't forgive. I can't let go of the offense, right? And so I want to talk to you about that. Because this is how I see it. I'm going to use an analogy here, right? The analogy to me is like, for unforgiveness, it's, it's kind of like an arrow that's been dipped, you know, in poison. And it's been shot at you. And it goes through your defenses and it hits you and it wounds you. For the moment. But then the real problem comes in the unforgiveness, the offense that we hold on to, is like a poison that comes up and through your body, right? It comes up and it starts to affect your thoughts and your vision. It affects you and unchecked, it'll even touch your heart and cause you not to be able to live, cause you not to be able to love or to be loved. You see, unforgiveness is a huge issue. And is one we, as Christ followers, need to tackle. Again, unforgiveness, it's like drinking poison, you know, and expecting the other person to die. But it only harms you. It only harms you. And I have love for you, and I want to make sure you get this, that unforgiveness is not something you want to hold on to. You want to let it go. Well, why then is it so hard for us to to not hold on to uh, forg uh, unforgiveness. Why is it so hard to forgive people? There are three things I want to talk to you about. First, I think it's because we have the wrong idea about forgiveness. We have the wrong idea about forgiveness. We think that, uh, you know, that old cliche that says, here it is, forgive and forget. Uh -huh. It don't work that way because you really don't forget, right? So really then, forgiveness is not about forgetting, right? It's not about minimizing it. What what forgiveness is, is, is about a statement that you believe that God can take the hurt that you feel when you give it to him and that he can bring good out of it. So it's a statement of faith. I believe, God, that you can use this in my life. That's what forgiveness is. Forgiveness also with these wrong ideas we have on the forgiveness is forgetting what happened, what we just talked about. 
It's also forgiveness means reconciliation must happen. And I just talked about reconciliation. But really, reconciliation is being reconciled to people. It doesn't have to happen for forgiveness to take place. Well, what do you mean? Listen, if nothing else, this is worth the getting up this morning and coming in. Forgiveness happens when you choose to let go of the offense. It has nothing to do with the reconciliation with people. That's part of the aftermath. But that doesn't have to happen. Why? Because reconciliation requires two people. And I think the Apostle Paul knew that when he said to us, if it is possible as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So there's a possible to connect with people. Maybe so, maybe not. Right? And so that when we're working through conflict, especially with somebody else, it can be so muddled. It can be so hard. And that's why I encourage you to be involved in small groups, to have that outside source coming in and kind of helping you to, to filter through all the things in your life. Right? So it's very important because uh, forgiveness is something that we wrestle with. And forgiveness does have its base a lot of times, unforgiveness, in the fact that we don't understand what forgiveness is. I've also noticed here that it's hard to forgive because we don't think it's fair. <laughs> we don't think it's fair. Like we have this fairness meter that's inside of us, and we go, hey, that's not fair to let that person off the hook, right? Here you go. Only thing is, God doesn't have that kind of fairness meter. You see, God offers forgiveness without merit. You don't have to earn it. Now, Jesus wanted to make sure we understood, and we see it all in the New Testament. He talks about this a lot, especially in the Gospels, right? And so what we see here is that uh, God wants us to know his type of fairness. And so I'm going to bring to you one of the ways I've seen it in, in a parable. The parable is the parable of the uh, debtor, the unforgiven debtor, right? And so I want to talk to you about that for a minute. It's in Matthew 18. I'm just going to tell you the story, remind you quickly about it, right? And so Jesus puts this parable forth, this story that said there once was a servant who owed his master a great deal of money, right? And this servant uh, that owed him, the king, which is the master, the king comes in, he says, I want to collect the money that you borrowed from me, basically, right? And the servant goes, well, I can't pay you now. And so the king now wants to exact justice because he wants his money because this guy owes him millions. And so he says, well, then that's fine. I'll sell, I'll confiscate all your property, and sell it, and I'll sell you and your family to repay some of the debt. Well, upon hearing this, that servant just fell to the ground and began to say, you know, plead and say, you know, please, master, give me more time to pay. Now, here you go. The king's heart was moved with compassion. And he looks at the man and he says to the, to the servant, I will forgive your debt. All the money that you owe me, I'm going to forgive. Isn't that great? Whenever I stop and I pause there, I think it's about us. I think it's about you and me, that our debt was so deep, was so vast, that there was no way we could pay off our debt. To whom? To God. We just couldn't pay it off at all. And then God, in his mercy, gave us Jesus Christ. And through the shed blood that he did on the cross, it gave us forgiveness but it also cleared out our debt. And so we have been forgiven much. And so when I read that, I think about us. The story goes on that this servant that was forgiven so much, he gets up from that situation, right, where he's just gotten that forgiveness of those millions. He goes out into the street, and there he finds a fellow servant, and that servant owed him a couple thousand dollars, right, just a couple thousand, which is still nothing to sneeze at. I mean, he's pretty big. But this servant, the first servant, decides to grab hold of the second servant by the throat and starts saying, you pay me back all the money you owe me. Of course, this second servant can't, and he falls down on his knees and he starts to beg, you know, for more time to pay. And the first servant looks at him and says, no, and has him thrown in jail, right? Well, the word gets back to the king who has just forgiven, and he calls back this first servant which is now termed the wicked servant. And as the wicked servant stands in front of him, he says, hey, I forgave you this huge debt. Why couldn't you treat your brother any better? Why couldn't you extend to him this grace, right? 
The man is defenseless. And so the king says to him, then I will do to you as you did to your brother. I will throw you in jail. Now, Jesus so wanted us to understand this parable that he comes back and he gives us a principle. And the principle is this. This is how my heavenly father, which is God, will treat each of you, will treat Sharon Mead, who will treat you this way, right? Unless you forgive, obey, forgive your brother from your heart. This is the principle that God wants us to understand. You see, God doesn't have a fairness meter like us. No. Rather, God says those who have been forgiven, they forgive. And that is how it is. And so there is no choice. And so I believe that when we start to tackle the question of why is it so stinking hard to forgive, we need to look at how we're defining it. We need to look at this fairness model. And this second and last one, we don't really think we can do it. We, you know, the wound is too big, right? You're like, you look and go, forgive, I hear you, but I just cannot do it. It's just humanly impossible. You don't know what's been done to me, Sharon, right? I cannot forgive. It's just humanly, I just cannot. And I, you know what? I'm not going to dispute that. But listen, if you're a Christ follower... Where humanist runs out, the divine kicks in. You see, when you were saved, when you gave your life to Christ, the infilling of the Holy Spirit took place, and all of a sudden you have the power of Christ that resides in you, and you can go forward, and you can obey what the Word of God says. Here you go. The Apostle Paul put it this way. He penned this. My grace is all you need. My grace, not your grace. His grace, God's grace is all we need. For my power is greatest in the weak places, right? And so that place that you feel like you just can't do it, God said he's going to come in. And the minute you start to step forward to obey, you are filled with a strength and a peace you never knew, and you can walk in it. Guys, God asks us to forgive, and we need to be able to forgive, right? We need to walk in that. So how do we know when we've achieved that? If I'm running through these here, how do I know that I truly have forgiven. Well, here you go, this last scripture. This is freedom in action. But to you who are willing to listen, see, the call comes out, are you willing to listen? Can you hear? Do you want to? Are you going to choose to listen to me? I say, love your enemies. Love those that have offended you. Love them, right? To your enemies. It says, do good to them, to bless them, and to pray for them. And it's got this series of things. And here's what I know about this scripture. When I am able to pray for, for the person that has offended me, right, to lift them up before the Lord, when I am able to bless them, instead of speaking curses like they spoke curse to me, instead of talking behind the back, shh, shh, I am able to choose to talk positive, right? And when I'm able to do good, which you're going to have to have a mindset, right? Mindset of, Lord, help me to do good in spite of what people are doing around me. When we start to function like this, then we know we truly are walking with the Lord. And we have truly embraced forgiveness. For it is indeed a walk. I call this, uh, this, this title, entitled this message, The Slippery Slopes. Of, uh, of, of forgiveness or of, of conflict because forgiveness is such a huge part of this, right? And we're, when we head into conflict, our feet can feel like we're slipping and sliding because it's just so difficult. But yet when we enact the word of the Lord, he shores up our feet. He shores us up inside and we can walk up a mountain and not stumble. Why? Because he's here. We just have to choose to start to enact what the word says. Now bow your heads with me. I'm going to close this in prayer. Holy Spirit, I thank you for coming. I thank you for being here, Lord. And Father, I know that this message of conflict and how to deal with that is something that's not only for our body, Lord, but it's for our nation. It's the conflict is raging all around us. And you have said to me, Sharon, I want my people to be like a lighthouse. And I want them to shine out. And I want them to show the, the love and the hope that they can have in Christ Jesus. So that all that are adrift in the conflict would know where they could come and have safe haven. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would do that now. That you have cast your nets out. 
Now pull in what you would, Father. I see. So Holy Spirit, I thank you that you are teaching us, that you are confronting us with our own uh, inconsistencies, Lord, so that we can be healthy on the inside and it can show on the outside. I hear. And so there are some of you, you might be watching online, you might be in the audience, and you can't really forgive because you haven't experienced that. And you so want to feel forgiven. And if that's an angst that you have, I want you to jet up your hands so that I can see you because I'm going to lead you in a prayer to help you to find that. So if you're in the audience, you can raise your hands. For those that are watching online, I want to encourage you right where you're at. You can just raise your hand. I want that peace. I see. Okay. So here you go. While everybody else around you is praying because they know the importance of being filled with the peace of Christ, I want you to just pray this prayer with me right now. You just say, Father God, I want that peace. And so I know it comes through your son, Jesus Christ, who forgave me my sins. And so today, I accept the gift of salvation, the gift of forgiveness. And so I come to you now, and I ask you to be the leader of my life. Okay. Father, for those who are praying that prayer, I ask that they can begin to feel the grace, the forgiveness that you have for us. I thank you that you write their name in the book of life, that you call them children of the God most high. And Father, I ask, as you have uh, given us this word, that we wouldn't shuffle it in our purse, in our bag, throw it in our car, but that we would, Father, have the courage to take it out and ask you, what does that mean for me? What does that mean for me? And the next Next, I hear that God says it's right around the corner. The next conflict, God wants you to use this to be that beacon that he's called us to be. Father, thank you. I thank you so very much that you love us. And Father, as I lift up your people, I thank you that you are teaching us to love you with all our heart, all our mind, all our soul, and with every breath of life, and to love people, to love our neighbors. You say this is the greatest. And so, Father, I lift us up, and I ask that you would help us to accomplish that in this time, Father, to make that mark on our generation. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.